di luar rumah ya. Oh, and we're on.
Hello. Hi. Hi, guys. I'm just testing out if this works. So, good afternoon. Maybe you can tell me where you guys are from. So, um, <laughs> I can give a shout out, I guess. Um, I have some people here watching. Nate, hi Nate, Danielle, Miss Hazel. Good afternoon to everyone. Wow, we have a viewer here from Bukidnon. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is my first time acting like a streamer, vlogger. <laughs> it's really cool. But I've done a few workshops before on writing, so. It should be up my same alley. Okay, we have one viewer from Quezon City, um, Marikina. Wow, everywhere. Have you guys tried um, writing your own books before? I would want to know. Maybe um, you can share with me if you've had a story, you've written a story before. Um, what genre is it? Or what is your favorite fiction genre? We'd like to know. Okay, we've someone here from Cebu. Um, Los Baños, Ilocos, Grave Guys, entire Philippines, Natu. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, we have a children's author one day. I'm wishing to be a children's author. Cool. Um, my personal genre is um, science fiction fantasy. All right, so I'm more into that. Uh, we have more viewers from Dumaguete. Wow, Galing. Tagig. Oh, someone's Barcada is watching from San Pablo, Laguna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think Central Books has a little spiel for us. We can start. And good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all having a great Monday. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Wash your hands and wear your mask when you're going out, okay? Uh, so you heard our speaker earlier, Miss Kat. So before I introduce her, welcome to another webinar series. This time we're going to tackle the first and probably the most daunting part of any book project. Agree naman kayo. Uh, let me know kung ito nga yung, um, let us know kung ito nga yung pinaka daunting na part sa any book project na ginagawa nyo. Ito yung pagsistart ng pagsusulat or writing. Now, uh, for this, uh, for today's session, we know fiction is one of your favorite genres. It is ours too. So, let's learn how to create a whole new world with very interesting characters. Uh, we're telling you that now's the time to uh, start that fiction writing project that you've always wanted to start. Make sure to take notes and get those writing tools ready. If you have any questions, feel free to comment them down below. We'll have a Q&A session after Miss Kat's talk. And we'll try to answer as much questions as we can. Uh, before I introduce Miss Kat, make sure to also like and share this session so that uh, we have more audience with us today. So, 
Today, we are delighted to bring you Ms. Katrina Olan, an author, copywriter, and creative advertiser. She was the country's representative as a student at the Cannes Lion Festival of Creativity 2018 and the first Filipino student of the Google Creative Campus 2018. Katrina Olan is also the author of The Bly, a Filipino science fiction novel, and Skies Above, a steampunk fantasy book. Everyone, let's let's welcome Ms. Katrina Olan. Hello. Hi guys, so thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, it's a pretty exciting day today. Um, so we're going to be really just jumping in into this whole experience of um, writing fiction. So I'm so glad that you're here um, today with me. Um, so now I'm going to share my screen and Ms. Hazel, please tell me if you can see it. <laughs> okay. Um, here you go. Can everyone see the screen? Um, okay. Good. So um, today, I'm going to be starting my talk on writing fiction. And you know, fiction is such an interesting thing. Fiction has a lot of magic. The, the way that we tell stories, whether that be fantastical, uh, magical realism, or whatever we have, it's really about letting your imagination go wild and really diving deep into the heart of what a human being is and how can we tell a, um, a compelling story. Okay, so actually, I just wanted to start off this talk with a game. Okay, let's play the game called Imagine This. Okay, so I just want everyone to close your eyes and just try to imagine this as I tell it to you. Okay, number one, I want you to imagine an intergalactic space warrior princess riding across the galaxy on a rainbow unicorn. All right. Okay, can you imagine it? Can you imagine going through the tendrils of nebula and space clouds and whatnot? Okay, let's go through number two. I want you to imagine a princess with powers that can control the weather. Okay, just, just really take it in. How would this princess look like? What kind of powers do, does she have, you know? Okay, third, I want you to imagine an ancient ruin that rises from the innards of the Pacific Ocean. Just imagine as it just totally crests over the waves and rises up into the sky and just brings wonder to everyone who sees it, right? And that is the power of fiction, guys. I mean, we've never actually seen an intergalactic space princess or have ever experienced going through space we've never seen someone or we have never met someone who can control the weather or we've never even seen someone that, you know, that we've never even seen a place that rises from the ocean. But by simply putting all of these ideas together and forming this really great concept, we see how powerful fiction can be. Fiction has the power to bring us to different worlds to transport us to Narnia, the world of Harry Potter, Star Wars, Game of Thrones, all of your favorite pop culture references. Um, fiction has a healing power too. It has this power to make us get in touch with ourselves um, and with these fantastic characters that we grow and love and consider to be our friends, perhaps our families, our crush. Guys, if you have a crush on a fictional character, you are a normal person. Um, fiction often helps us examine our reality. While on the other hand, real life news often aims to mystify or hide truth. And that's what we're experiencing today, guys. So in an age where most truth aims to be hidden, we need fiction to bring out the truths about ourselves and our society. And I believe that's the most powerful thing that fiction can do today, okay? And that's exactly why we're here. Today, I'm going to teach you how to write fiction with me, Kat Olan. 
Yes. So before we dive into this fictional world, um, I'm just going to tell you about myself. So why should we listen to this girl? Okay. So hi, I'm Kat. Um, day job. My day job is I'm a copywriter at Densu Jaime Saifu. Um, it's, it's an advertising agency here in Manila. So I write scripts for um, commercials, uh, TV commercials. I write scripts for radio commercials and digital films, but most are for um, branding and selling purposes. Um, I was actually chosen as the student representative to the Can Lion International Festival of Creativity back in 2018 as the country representative. So they choose one person per country for this marketing workshop for the top student marketers around the world. Um, it's held at Can. Think of it as the Academy Award for advertising. Um, and after that, that same year, I was chosen as the first um, Filipino student of the Google Creative Campus um, at the Googleplex in Silicon Valley. So there I learned about the future of um, technology and marketing from the top tech gurus in the world. Aside from that, you can say I'm also a filmmaker um, since I write all of these scripts. Um, I love making films, whether that be for commercials or personal films. Um, for my work, I've actually worked on some brands like Klook. Perhaps you've seen um, Pila Sa Train to Busan, which is a, it's a spoof of um, the Train to Busan thing. I've recently worked um, for Century Tuna. Um, my first ever video project was National Bookstore, and I've worked on this recent commercial for Signal TV featuring Marvin Malonza's Tabipo. Yun. It's pretty cool. Um, I'm also a self-published author. Uh, I publish with Central Books, publish on demand, the OG. Um, my first ever book was Skies Above. It's a steampunk fantasy novel um, set in a floating world. It's a story of a boy and a stone that could change the fate um, of the world of Hysterios. It took me seven years to write that. My second book was Tablay. Um, it's the current thing that I'm really bannering right now. Um, it's a Filipino sci-fi novel that brings together the edge of futuristic fiction and the mysticism of Philippine mythology. So think of it like Pacific Rim times Trece, just like mechanized aswangs and all that shebang. Um, recently, we just sold out for the Bly, so thank you guys so much for the support. I know there are some, of, some readers here, people from the bookish community, my friends and family, so shout out to you guys. Thank you so much. Okay, so now let's begin our journey, really diving into this meat of how do I write fiction? Okay, I'll take you through an intergalactic adventure through four different planets. Um, and these are the four different elements of the story. So, so normally this is um, how I do the writing. Um, I know that there could be different ways, but this is how I've personally, um, personally experienced it. Okay, so I'm going to take you through premise, um, setting, characters, and plot, okay? And these are four elements that must work harmoniously to bring the story together and really bring it to life and thrust your story forward. You know, a lot of times we think that, okay, we sit down, we start writing, we get writing, then we get lost. Because, you know, we, we're having this momentum, we're building it up, and then suddenly we just lose all juice. It's because, you know, we start out with feeling things and then later we realized we don't have a structure for it. But actually constructing a story is quite scientific. There's actually an equation to it. So if we master that equation, if we learn how the system is done, we can break the system and we can be more accurate and more imaginative with how we execute our stories. So let me be the one to tell you how the equation works and let me help you engineer that story. Okay, let's begin. So for the purpose of explaining all the concepts of this story, um, so that it's not just vague and I'll just tell you, okay, this is what a plot is, this is what a character is supposed to be like. Um, I'm going to show and use examples from my story, um, Tablay, just to concretize whatever I teach you. But no worries, if you want to concept test your own story, or if you want to try building your story and generating it here, right here, right now, um, just get a piece of paper, um, get a pen, and you can write down, and we can help build your story within this very hour, all right? Okay, 
so let's let's get started first we'll start off with premise okay first is premise it's very important why because this is the main idea behind your story this is the basic foundation of your work okay think of it like your thesis statement guys if you don't have your thesis statement your whole thesis will fall apart of course the premise will beg the question what is your story about okay when you write a story guys at the heart of every story is a premise and a promise a promise to take your readers into this fantastic adventure a promise to delight them to surprise them to make them laugh to make them cry everything but the first thing you have to do with your premise is to make your readers care from the onset, the story needs to draw sympathy from your audience. And I learned that from Andrew Stanton. He's one of the head animators of Pixar. He's made some of your most favorite movies. Okay. And how do you make people care? People should care because the story can be relatable. The story can mean something to that. And that's how we start writing the premise. You have to ask yourself, what is the human question? What is the insight that I want to draw out from the story? And how do you do this? I want you to observe what's around you and dig deeper into the meaning of things. We call this an insight. An insight is a deeper truth about the world, about humanity, about yourself that needs to be uncovered. It can't just be observed. It has to be dug up. And it's usually exposed with the question, why? Why is this happening? to society, um, why is it like this for the human being, okay? For Tablay Noman, when I was started writing it, the question that I wanted to ask was, you know, society is becoming more and more technologically advanced, <clears throat> but with all of this progress, how is it that we are becoming less human? You know, there's so many troubles going on despite the fact that there's so much technological advancement. So also ask yourself when you're building the story, what is this insider question you want to, to ask? After you ask that question, the next step is ask yourself, what is the human condition? What is the current status quo of humanity when it comes to that insight? So right, I ask, how is it that with all this progress, um, humans are becoming less humane? The human condition that I found for that is we realize that people are becoming less human because technology is evolving at a pace much faster than the change within our society, ourselves and our choices. So you're like, whoa, big words, right? Like, how did you figure that out, Kat? Chempre observation, um, just really think and reflect. And that's what's so great about writing and, and, and just thinking about what is it that really makes our society tick and churn okay so first again insight human condition and after that put it to the extremes once you've had the human condition um society is uh, technology is evolving at a pace much faster than our so ourselves our society and whatnot what if we put that condition to the extreme what if people kept on using technology for death and destruction? And that's when I decided for the premise of Tablai that humans would be at war with each other through gigantic mechanized suits for over a hundred years. See, so it's really looking at the story level by level, putting these building blocks together and really coming up with that strong premise. After putting their story to the extreme, you have to ask yourself what virtue is being highlighted here? What is the virtue that we want to highlight? Um, for the story, probably the virtue that I wanted to highlight was prudence. Um, we still have the choice to use technology for good, despite all the evil it has capacity for. We have to choose technology for good. Right, okay. So that is how you build the premise, guys. Always first start with the human insight. So what is that burning question you have about humanity? Next is, what is the human, question, uh, human condition? After asking yourself, what is the human condition? I want you to put that condition to the extreme. And once the extreme has been met, what is the virtue that you want to pluck out of this extreme scenario? 
Okay. Uh, sorry, I might be going so fast, but let's just, you know, marinate that thought. Human insight, condition, extreme, virtue. Okay. So once we have that all placed, if you put that all together, that's how you write your premise. So the premise of Tablai is, in a never-ending mech war, the heroes will show us that we always have the choice to use technology for good, despite all its capacity for evil. See? Simple log line. So the log line is the story in one or two sentences that will express its entire thought. That is how you write a premise. And a strong premise will just tie everything in together. And that's why you need it. Okay. Next, let's zoom off to the next planet over here. The planet of setting, which is the location of your story. Now, just as important as your premise is the setting, because you have to ask yourself, what kind of setting would fit this premise? So now you have the premise. What kind of setting would fit in this story? So never-ending mech war, what has never been done before? Wait, why not the Philippines? I mean, no one has ever tried doing mech war Philippines before. So for Tablai, I chose uh, futuristic Philippines. It's New Intramuros. It's a hyper-technological walled city. And beyond it, vast mountains and jungles filled with hostile machine life called Aswang. So you see how we really natutuhog nyo yung, um, yung premise to the setting, then later to the characters, and then to the plot. Okay, so that's the setting of Tablai. What's important to note about the setting is that the setting must always add texture to the plot. It must always complement how the plot is made. The setting is the board on which your characters will play the game. Your setting is where the pieces will move around. So even in the way that you construct it, like how I constructed the setting of Tablai, which is New Intramuros, um, it's the walled city itself is a symbol of the unspoken cast between what is happening um, inside the walls of Intramuros versus the walls and the vast mountains and jungles outside. So even within the city itself, there is a hierarchical structure which is maintained and the motif is set within the city. Now, because in New Intramuros, uh, the rich people, the richest of the rich live in the center, habang yung mga middle class na sa side, tapos yung urban poor live in districts, slum districts like Mataas na Pader. So even the way that the, the setting is formed should complement the story. Um, now here are some setting FAQs. Like Kat, how do you build a very rich world, right? Um, here are some things that you can uh, lift off from. You can ask questions like, what is your city's government? What is your city's social caste? What is your world's currency? What are the traditions? What's its religion? What's its economy? Um, are there points of interest that can really complement the story? It's really delivering that very rich setting because like I said, it has to be, it has to really complement the story and move the story forward, right? So after the setting, okay, we're going to zoom off to planet number three. Um, just tell me if I'm moving a bit too fast, but in the interest of time, we have to move fast. I'm so sorry. Usually takes more years um, to do this, but I'm, I'm all squeezing it into an hour. Okay, um, we're going to move over to characters. I love this part. I love building characters. Um, the characters are the actors in your story. And these are the ones that move the story forward. The characters have, the, have to be the ones that push the story. The plot, does not, the plot does not push it. The characters with their motivations pushes the story forward and not the other way around. Okay, so we've moved on. So we've asked the question, what is the premise? Okay, then we've asked the question, what is the setting that would fit this premise? Okay, then you have to ask yourself, who are the characters that would fit in this setting? Okay. For Tablai, we know that it takes place in a 
um, hyper-technological walled city of New Intramuros. So who exactly would be characters that would fit in this futuristic city of Intramuros? Well, I say, I say there could be mech pilots, of course, because it's a mech war. Um, there would be military leaders, of course, because it's a, it's a mech force. And of course, there would be scientists because it would be a sci-fi novel. It won't be a sci-fi novel without scientists. So that's how you kind of, I'm just bringing you through my thought process of how I do it. So it's really like, who are the perfect characters for the setting? And with that, that's how I came up with my three primary characters for the story of Tablai, which is my main character is mech pilot Anya Valerio. Um, the villain of the story is General Cesar Nicanor. And the flight engineer or the scientist would be her, also her love interest, um, si Chino Jose. Okay, so more than perfect, you know, your characters must be relatable. And I believe that this is the most important part of building characters. More than perfect, your characters have to be real. They have to be three-dimensional. They have to have strengths to make them likable, but they also need to have weaknesses. And these weaknesses would often prove adversity for the heroes, for the villains, and make them really more compelling. And that's why you have to ask yourself, what is your character's virtue? And what is your character's vice? Okay, strengths, but also coupled with weaknesses. And these are evident in my characters. Okay, so like Anya, she's so strong. I mean, strong-willed, perhaps she's a talented fighter, but also she's so filled with such pride to the sense now when people try to correct or criticize her, she will not understand or will fight back. Cesar Nicanor, he is the villain of the story. He's this charismatic leader. He's very charismatic. He's very enigmatic. He can convince people to do everything, but he's very inflexible with his values. He will not stop unless the peace and order within New, New Intramuros is obtained. And finally, we have Chino who's the flight engineer, who's very intelligent. I mean, he's the one who designed the weapon of mass destruction in the book. But the thing is, he's such a pushover. Like everyone's stepping on him and he'll just bow down to everyone. So it's really the character dynamics that really move the story and create these complex characters that, have the, that create this compelling narrative. Your character's motivations must move the plot forward. Like I said, not the other way around because it's the inner fire in these characters that will really drive them to do the actions and to really push the story forward. In the case of Anya, her story is proving her self-worth um, as the daughter of a general too. Um, for Nicanor, it's really maintaining peace and order. And for Chino, it's really having doing his duty above all things. But later you'll see that he'll have to make a choice between um, following his duty and serving the truth. Okay, but the thing about motivations is, motivations are not necessarily good, but that they're there to provoke action. What do I mean? We have so much good motivations, you know? Um, we have good motivations like family, hope, dreams, love, these are all good things that, that motivate characters, but there are equally bad things that motivate characters too. Fear, fanaticism, shame, anger. All these things move the characters forward, backwards, spiraling around in circles, but so they're there to provoke action in the service of the narrative. Okay. Usually, we think of characters kasi in silos. When we write characters, we're like, okay, I know there's my main character who's Anya. Um, I know there's gonna be a love interest. I know there's gonna be a villain. I know Anya's gotta have a best friend and a rival and her mentor, see Sergeant Perazzo. Well, the thing is, usually um, rookie writers make a mistake of just putting the the characters in different silos like i said like they're all disjointed from each other but so they have to be there but what i learned from storytelling from from the screenwriting program is that 
the characters, the supporting characters, have to reveal more about the main character in different ways. By slowly revealing through the dialogue, through their interactions, we kind of realize more about the main character, what drives her, what motivates her. Let me explain. In Tablai, um, the villain would definitely reveal more about Anya's adversity quotient, how she can face the problems and trials ahead of her. The lover, of course, would expose the main character as a lover. The rival would expose the main character's power struggle, you know, like who's the alpha dog, who's the top character. The mentor, Sergeant Parazo, exposed his Anya's naivety, showing her, hey, you might think you know so much about the world, but you have to stay humble because you haven't seen anything yet, girl, I'm telling you. And of course, um, the best friend would expose the main character as a friend, you know, that platonic relationship. Okay. Okay, so let's just uh, get a summary of characters again. Okay. Right, I'm on a roll, guys. Characters, first ask yourself who would fit into the premise. Second, ask yourself what are their virtues and vices. Third, ask yourself what are the characters' motivations and fears. And then fourth, ask yourself how do these characters relate to each other in this complex web. Of course, you're going to say, oh, cat, but that's so complex because we have to mind map everything from how the characters relate to each other to how do, you, how do they relate to the villain. Well, you can do that in your pre-writing phase, but when it comes to actual writing, it's important that you are very smart and deliberate on how you pick when these characters' interactions should have their own shining moments. They could be through the important plot points, waypoints in the stories, the climax, even in the beginning, um, the first act of the story, or in, never at the ending, because you're resolving everything at that point. Okay. Now we're going to move on um, to the last planet. Wow, that's 30 minutes in. Okay, great. I guess I can take the slower now, because uh, we still have some time. So the plot is, okay, I want everyone to digest what they've just learned. So premise is, what is the heart of your story? Setting is, where does the story take place? Three, who are the actors in the story? How do they relate to each other? What are their fears and motivations? And now let's move on to the plot, which is the structure of the story. Okay, um, I'm just giving you a caveat. This can be a bit heavy. So if you have questions, um, maybe you can ask me later. Okay, uh, we're usually taught in school the three act structure. Act one, act two, act three. You've probably seen this graph. So among uh, grade three, grade four, grade five, ito. it's the upwards, um, it's the triangle, which is the, which is the structure of the story. Um, we're taught in school that the first act must be the exposition. Then we move on um, to the next act. There will be an inciting incident, which will trigger the second act of the story. There will be rising tension and rising action until we finally hit the climax, which is the peak of the story, the story with the most intense moment, and it will beg the X, Y question. Will the hero survive? Um, will Luke Skywalker join the dark side? Will Harry Potter get killed by Voldemort? Will Frodo give in to the power of the ring at Mount Mordor? Right. And then finally, we have the resolution. Now, this is the standard story plot. So this is the basic equation to a story. Of course, once we master this, we can move on to um, definitely more creative ways of executing it, but this is how the skeleton usually goes. So I'm gonna explain each stage as thoroughly as I can. So for act one, we're setting the stage. So when we set the stage, that's really when the hero is at status quo. This is what we call the normalcy of things. 
This is where we definitely get to know the characters, where we expose the setting. If we're talking about pop culture, this is when um, this is when Frodo is, is still at the Shire. Um, this is uh, this is when in Tablai, let's say this is when um, Anya just joined the PMF and she's learning all about the stuff about the Mech Force. It's here where we get to know the characters. So in Lord of the Rings, who are there in their, their party, you know, um, who's there in the Fellowship of the Ring, um, who are the members of the Mech Force. And it's here where we expose the setting then. Like what is this large world that we are going to explore? So this is where we give the promise of the story. Okay. But the thing is, Anton Chekhov, one of the most famous writers said, if in the first act, you have hung a pistol on the wall, then in the following one, it should be fired. What does that mean? We call this interesting thing, the inciting incident or the crossing of the threshold. This is the catalyst that sets the protagonist's adventure in motion whether that be the big plot twist, the invitation into the new world, this inciting incident is the crucial beat in the three-act story structure. Without it, the story in question would not exist. For example, this is when, um, I'm going to use Lord of the Rings again, I'm sorry, this is the one that I'm most familiar with. This is when Frodo finally sees the ring in Bilbo's hands and, and then Bilbo was like, no, it's time, you know, like that. And then he realized the power of the ring and that Gandalf tells him, okay, you have, you have, we have to go on this adventure and you have to come out with me. Um, in Harry Potter, it's the revelation that there is a dark Lord. And in that um, crossing of the threshold, it's going to propel Harry forward and build him through that seven book saga um, that he has to do that. The inciting incident for the Hunger Games is when, is when Effie Trinket pulls out, um, pulls out um, Primrose's name from the, from the bowl and announces that she will be the one fighting in the Hunger Games. And Katniss says, no, it's me. I, I, I volunteer as tribute. See, so that, that's really the one that will set the story into motion. Okay, my tip for writing the inciting incident and the second act is if it's deliberate, if the character brought themselves into that scenario, motivate, motivate the character to keep on going and um, to keep on going and just keep that momentum forward. If the character got into the inciting incident by accident, the second half of the story would be dedicated to the character trying to get out of that situation. Okay, let's go back to the Hunger Games. So um, Katniss got into the Hunger Games by accident. You know, she didn't want to be in the Hunger Games. Like, who wants to be in the Hunger Games, right? Um, so the story of her in the second act is her trying to survive or get out of the Hunger Games alive. And when building that story, you have to be intentional about how she does it. How does the, how does the character get out of the Hunger Games alive or dead? And that's when we move on to act two, confrontation. This is the longest of acts. It will probably take the second and third quarter of your book. So this is what we call the middle, the middle of the story. This is rising action and tension and the events will turn on the hero. In the story of Tablai, the inciting incident was when Anya Valerio figured out the dark secret about the Aswangs, which just totally turned her whole worldview on her head. And now she has to stop the Bakunawa bomb their weapon of mass destruction from being created before it kills thousands of people. So act two is dedicated to her unraveling the mystery and stopping the bomb. This is the rising, and ten, uh, rising action and tension of the story. And the events must definitely turn on the hero and the hero has to fight against it. Okay, how do you make a good tension in the story? You have to ask yourself the stakes. What does your character have to lose in this story? 
For Katniss, what she had to lose was her sister and her own life. The higher the stakes, the more interesting the story. Hmm. For Lord of the Rings, it would be probably the world. I mean, come on, if you don't get, if the ring falls into the hands of the wrong person, if it falls into the hands of Gollum or Sauron or the dark forces, grabe, siempre, the world order would just definitely turn on itself. The higher the stakes, the more interesting the story. Um, in Tablai, the stakes definitely for Anya was her own self-worth because all her life, she wanted to be a top mech pilot. But the, the moment that she found out the dark truth about the Aswang, she was like, am I, what, what am I doing? Like, am what I'm doing even morally right? You know, and I have to stop this. So act three is the resolution. Here, it's one of the shortest parts of the story, but this is because all the tension is just building up, you know? All the action is coming together. It's snowballing until it finally meets at that point. After that, we have the denouement. And this is when we fulfill the promise to the readers. Okay, so the climax is when, okay, here's the thing about writing act two. You have to keep on forcing the hero and the villain to repeatedly intersect. They have to keep on, their paths have to one way or another keep on crossing until their meeting is inevitable at the climax. Okay, let's set some examples. Star Wars. Um, finally, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader meet, you know, at that really rickety rig where Luke goes, you killed my father. The Sabini Darth Vader. No, Luke, I am your father. So that's the climax of the story when the main character and the villain really physically have to meet each other. Um, in Tablai, Anya finally confronts General Nicanor. And usually when writing the setting in this, even the way that the setting has to be built or constructed, it has to become, become more constricting. And the most narrow point of the story in terms of the setting is the point of the climax. Think about it. In Star Wars again, we are, we are brought into this fantastical vast galaxy at the exposition of the story. But the story becomes deeper and deeper and narrower and narrower until the setting for the climax is in the Death Star itself, in that rickety rig where Luke almost falls off. In Lord of the Rings, it's in the Mount, it's in Mount Doom itself. It's the narrowest point of the story. In Tablai, the setting is secret lang, because you have to read the book. Oh, diba? So <laughs> that's what the climax has to be about. And of course, you have to end strong. You have to make sure that the story is neatly tied up, that you have loose ends, and the promise. That you that you give to your readers will be fulfilled, or else, parang what are they going to do? How you promised me this and you didn't deliver, so that's bad. At the end of the story, you must always ask the question, or the the question must always be answered: What is the human being as an individual, and what is the human being as a society or as a whole? What do we have to say as the of the person as an individual, and what can we say about society and as a whole? So here are some tips I have for you for writing the story. Okay, don't give readers four. Give them two plus two. What do I mean? Readers actually like working for the story. Because if you feed them all this information, if you info dump them, apparently it loses its magic. You know, they say that writing, writing a story is like delivering a joke. You have to deliver the punchline at the end, but you have to build up for it. Readers like working for the story. They like figuring things out. So don't spell it out for them, you know? Show, don't tell. 
like when I was building up the mystery of Operation Tablay, I didn't just info dump it like, okay, this is what happened in Operation Tablay. Um, 2,000 MiG pilots went to the foot of Mount Pinatubo and then so many of them died. No, we see the story of Operation Tablay unfold through different aspects in the chapters and Anya goes through these mysteries one by one. That's what I mean. Of course, engage all the senses. If you can find a way to engage the, the readers with your descriptions, make it flowery. Um, make it flowery if you need to, but I say keep it short and simple because that's the way that I like to write. I don't know, maybe some of you are more purple prose people who focus on the beauty of writing, but me, I'm, I'm very pragmatic. I get straight to the point. If the story can be told in a simple way that's effective, I would do it. Um, engage sight, sound, touch if possible, smell, and make sure to tidy up when you um, resolve the story. Don't lose, uh, don't leave loose ends unless you intend to continue the series. Yun. And with that, kasi, um, I'll show you my process of writing. Usually, I'd like to start at the beginning, of course, because every story needs to start, you have to know where you're coming from. Then once you write the beginning, the next thing that you have to write is the ending. Sometimes kasi, okay, I'm gonna write the story chronologically, right? And finally, when you're at the ending, you lose all momentum. So you're like, oh man, that was a really shitty ending, right? Oh wait, sorry, I cursed. Okay, uh, just bleep that out. <laughs> um, and then I write the midpoint of the story. Um, so, that's where that's where the high middle is. Okay, um, this is where we have the most tension in the story. Perhaps writing the climax, and then I want you to write everything in between. That's what you want to do. So start at the beginning, write your ending, and find your way how to get there in between. Okay, so that's what we have for plot. What is the beginning? What is the ending? What is your middle part? And finally, what when you end the story, what is the human being as an individual and as society as a whole? Okay, I want you to remember these things. Yun. So just to give you a summary of whatever I said, you know, you can take a picture of this, screenshot it, capture it. So you also have the equation, write it down. Here, this is what I'm saying. This is how you write fiction. Begin with your premise. Human insight, the human condition. Take the condition to the extreme. Figure out the virtue that you want to expose in the story. Then move over to your setting. Where does your story take place? build that setting. After that, figure out who are the characters that would most fit into the setting. Write the tropes, put it down, then identify who these characters are. Who is your main hero? Who is your main villain? Who are the love interests and the supporting characters? What are these characters' virtues and vices? After that, what are their character motivations? And finally, how do they relate to each other in an ecosystem? Once you have your premise, settings, and character, move over to your plot. What is your beginning? What is your end? What is your high middle? What is the human being as an individual and society as a whole? Yun. So with that, here are some final words. Um, what I showed you right now is basically a guide. Definitely, it would be nice to follow this. Um, practice, practice, Muna. Practice first on how we can do this. And once that you've finally mastered this, you are free to break the guidelines. You are free to experiment on how you want to, um, how you want to experiment with the story. And of course, have fun. I mean, don't take it, don't take yourself so seriously. Don't don't hit yourself or get sleepless nights <laughs> over overriding, but really just take time and you know just find your own rhythm, and 
relish in the process, you know? Okay. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone so much um, for joining me today. Um, you can contact me at these numbers. Um, so I put my cell phone there, I put my number there. And um, for social media, um, you, can, you can find me on Facebook, IG, Twitter, through the Tablai page. And if you want to order two, why not? Okay. And with that, thanks so much, guys. And I hope that you had a really good 50 minutes of your time to learn how to write fiction. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Kat, for that very uh, informative talk. Uh, now let's get to some of the questions our audience has posted below. Uh, okay, so we'll start with uh, uh, James Lackey. He asked, for you, what makes a compelling villain? Uh, okay, so I always believe that the villain is a foil of the main character. What do I mean? The villain brings out the best and the worst of the main character. The villain has, making a compelling villain means you have, the villain brings out the best and the worst in the main character. Usually the best villains are a dark reflection of the main character. What do I mean? Um, in my story, um, Tablai, both the villain, General Nicanor and Anya, both wish to preserve peace and order in New Intramuros. But for my hero, um, Anya, the way that she wants to um, maintain peace and order or to maintain this ideal world is to save people. But Nicanor believes that to maintain an ideal world, people have to die. And we have to sacrifice some of our values to maintain this peace and order. So that's what I'm saying. The same is evident with um, Batman and the Joker. You see that both Batman and Joker have their own visions of, of Gotham City. But the way that, that, um, that the villain tackles how to get this peace and order or how to maintain or create their ideal Gotham City is so different. So that's how I, I, would, I would say. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kat. Uh, we have another question from Seth Ganad Ganandoy. Uh, Genandoy, sorry. Uh, how do you create a unique character that the readers can relate to? Oh, okay. Um, how can you... Okay. Uh, from my personal experience, how I wrote my characters were based of people that I knew. Um, and my friends, my families, I'm sure that we leave pieces of ourselves um, in everything that we do, whether that be creating art or writing stories, writing music. My, um, my suggestion is to really figure out people's habits, observing people. Are there any, any interesting people you've seen or met in your life? What story do they have to tell? Maybe you can combine some characters, some compelling people in your life. Um, my suggestion is though, and I tell this to all of my, of all of my readers um, and my fans, do not, do not read materials that are just confined to your own genre. Like for example, when I, when I wrote Tablai, I did not only read science fiction because come on, you're just going to end up with tropes that have been done over and over and over again. If you want a compelling story, go out of your comfort zone. Um, I studied everything from basic engineering. I studied everything from how, how the military works, nonfiction. I read, I read a lot of World War II books to get real accounts of soldiers. I read about basic psychology, how people work with PTSD. I read... Just a lot of things, geopolitical history and whatnot. Yep. Okay. Um, so another question po from Diane de Guzman Pulong. In fiction writing, what are the cliches to avoid? 
Did you have any tips for that? Yeah. Um, so obviously when we write, we can't avoid naman that we fall into cliches because if you if you talk about it, if you think about it, everything is a remake. We all borrow ideas from each other. Um, but it's in the way that we execute the story that would really make it your own. Um, just coding, because um, Sir Budgetan, I Sir Budge, if you're watching, shout out. Um, he's the creator of um, of Trese, the comic, the the crime noir, um, Philippine mythology. Oh God, I love it! I'm so excited for the Netflix anime to come out. Um, so Sir Budge is a friend of mine too. We talk a bit, and he said that to create a unique story, you have to look at the ordinary and put a magical twist to it. Find extraordinary in the ordinary, put your own personal experience to it, and you'll create something that's your own because only you have your own point of view. Only you see the world in the, in the way that you see it. So if you can inject something personal, it would definitely make it less cliche because you're the only one who experienced it. Okay, so, um... Thank you for that. Uh, we have another question from Suzanne Mitch de la Cruz. <laughs> um, when do you usually expose the villain? Ah. It really depends on the on the purpose of your story. Um, in my story, the villain did not come out until the inciting moment. So parang secret villain siya. Like, what? You're the, you were the villain all along. It was kind of like a red herring sort of thing. Oh God, was that a spoiler? Anyway, so, so, um, uh, shit. I, sorry. Um, so what happens is, um, depending on the purpose of your story, you can already show the villain on the onset of the story. Okay, so what are some villains on the onset of the story? Lord of the Rings. We already know that, that Sauron is the villain from the get-go. Or you can expose your villain later for suspense, like um, Nicanor or Scar. But the, the point is, if you want to put that reveal or move that reveal later into the story, you can't just pop out of nowhere, you know? I mean, you have to leave breadcrumbs. That's part of Chekhov's gun. You have to leave breadcrumbs identifying that one way or another, this person is going to come out. Because it's useless naman if you're like, boom, he's the villain, and then you're like, what? Where did that even come from? Okay. So that's that's my suggestion. But never at the ending. Because like, huh? <laughs> so you're already at the end of the story and the villain suddenly comes out. Nope. Okay. So um, in relation po dun sa topic natin, the villain now, uh, is it possible that a villain could be the person's emotion or unmeet desires? This question is from Rin Lim. Okay. Very good question, Rin Lim. Thank you for, ans uh, for asking the question. Okay, so when writing, there are different kinds of conflict. There's man versus man, which is like um, a war story. Let's say Star Wars is man versus man. There's man versus environment, where the environment turns on him. Let's say Geostorm. Geostorm, if you watch that movie, definitely the, the, different, the different environmental conditions turn on the character. Or um, Call of the Wild, or um, what's a very good example of man versus environment? 168 hours. Remember that movie where the guy climbed Mount Everest and he was just like dying and he was just trying to survive? That's man versus environment. There's also man versus himself, which answers your question. The, the villain can be, can be himself, can be his own mental state, his own emotions, his own, his own past. Okay, let me give you a very good example. From Inception. The main character. See, oh no, I forgot the name of I forgot the name of the main character. Um, just just keep, let's just call him Leo. Alam mo yung nangyari kay Leo naman no sa Inception. 
he he was tied down by his past by Maul, right? His wife that that died. And throughout Inception, although they're making progress in the movie, he's always taken aback by his past, by his by his dead wife. And that really that really comes back to him as one of the greatest hindrances in the story. And if he doesn't face his past, the story will not be resolved. So that's an example of that. So whether that be mental state, let's say your own anxiety, your own depression, your suicidal thoughts, although it's very, very tricky to write about these topics unless you really get into the heart of them or if you're experiencing them yourself, you know, you, we can't just be, um, we can't just write about these things without prior research and empathy. Yun. So that's what we have to do. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kat. So, um, we have another question from Christian Zeko. Uh, so this one's more of your um, parang influences ng writing mo. So were there any Filipino writers that influenced how you write and construct your stories and narratives or arcs? If so, who are they and how have they sh helped shape your stories? Great question. Thank you for that. Um, I love, okay, so I took a lot from actually my favorite, What one of the things that inspired me to write Tablay was um, Gerald Tarog's Henera Luna and Goyo, the Bayani verse. I mean, it was such a, it was such a very good film. And the fact that it was indie, like, guys, we really have to support our local, our local scene because we have such great talent. We have such great stories to tell. I took a lot of inspiration from General Luna and Goyo when it came to writing Tablay, especially with the political intrigue. I think the way that um, Gerald Tarog crafted um, crafted both movies, he was the writer, director, editor, and scorer. Grabe, one-man band siya. Um, direct Gerald was so amazing with how he delivered the beats of the story, like never a dull moment. But at the same time, through through these thought provoking dialogue, it really brought out more questions about the state of of the Philippines. Then, like what's happening recently, and I'm really all about fiction as a way to evoke social political commentary. Like that's that's always been one of my advocacies. Um, that's why you can see that in Tablay Din. Um, I think that he's one of the influences in my story. Another one is Sir Budget Tan, like I said. So hi, Sir Budge. And hi, Direct Gerald, if you're watching. I hope I can talk to you one day. <laughs> talk to you about the Tablai movie joke. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, Sir Budge, he also influenced me. Um, I loved his very dark version of Manila. Um, aside from that, other Filipino influences... Ah, my family. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, when I was writing Tablay, I didn't read much fiction. I took a lot of inspiration from World War and World Two, World War One and World War Two narratives, um, especially to those that happened in my family. Um, my grandfather was actually one of the captains um, that served in the Philippine Army Reserve. He actually survived the death march. Um, so that, that was a really cool thing. Um, their family was there in Pangasinan as the Japanese came in Lingayan Gulf. As they started carpet bombing um, our ancestral home, they learned how to survive in the fields, smoking, smoking as early as six years old just to keep the mosquitoes away from biting them. And it's just this whole over-encompassing narrative that I drew a lot of things from. Um, I also I also took inspiration from the people that I've met. So it's really real life scenarios. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, more questions for uh, this time from uh, Maria Teresa Olvido. So more of technical part naman ng writing. So her question is, how do you make 
or split the story into chapters? Mm, okay. Um, usually, the chapters is a creative decision. But how I would like... Okay, so you can either... Whether depending on how you, how you split the chapters is based on how you want to set the pacing of the story. Usually, um, if you have shorter chapters, let's say it will run... Because the thing is, and you know this, Miss Hazel, as a publisher, um, it will depend on the page count of the story then and the font size. So how many, how many, how many pages will that be? What font size will that be? What are the margins? So that will dictate the length of the chapter. But when writing the manuscript, when it comes to splitting the the chapters, it depends on the pace that you want to set. Um, imagine it like you are writing episodes of a series. Would you want that series to be like a series of shorts, na parang anthology? I would suggest you split the chapters into shorter chapters. But if you want the if you want the reader to really sink slowly into the moment, you would want to make longer chapters. Um, pero if you want to speed up some some parts of the story, I would suggest breaking it up into a specific chapter to connote the importance of that moment. Let's say in Tablai again, the moment where the plot twist comes out is actually one of the shortest chapters of the book. And I, I, I isolated that moment to that chapter because it serves a very important uh, purpose in the story. Because think of it also like you're editing a video. So we go, because I think that being a, um, being a film writer and being an editor myself, editing chapters is like editing a film. They have beats. So this clip is like, pack, pack, pack. You know, it has a rhythm to it. Pack, 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 pack. So it's how the way that the story flows that you want to, uh, you want to build that momentum. So that's, that's how you decide how long or short the chapter would be based on its um, importance to the story. Okay, so uh, in relation to uh, pacing, Miss Kat, uh, Lance Barreto is also asking, when writing action scenes naman po, uh, should the pacing be fast or slow or normal? Ah, thank you, Lance, for this. I love writing action scenes. They are my favorite thing to write. And um, all my... All the, all the reviewers of Tablai said that um, the action scenes were one of the most superb elements of the, of the book. I think that words have rhythm. So, so whether it comes to writing a long set, think of it again, like ramping your story into hyperspeed or slowing it down for slow motion. And that's what you have to do with your words. So let's say that usually to set the pace for actions, like how I personally do it, is that I write it fast. Oh, do I have a copy? Oh, I have a copy of my book here. Wait long. So I'll show you guys some of... There, these are my two books. So, pero medyo old na siya because this is the first proof copy that Miss Hazel sent with all my shin side. Okay, so I'll, I'll read you a... I'll read you a... See, so I'll show you guys a bit about it. See, we, we, you make all these comments and then you... You, you see all of the, the proofings that we have to do for it. It really goes through a lot of work. So thank you, Miss Hazel, for being so patient with us and doing all this stuff. Okay, I'm going to read a, a, an action scene from the book. I'll show you guys um, how speeding up and slowing down your action scenes can work. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read from the spoilery part of the book without really spoil it, spoiling. <laughs> this is what you... Okay, I'll, I'll read two parts of it. Okay, oh, this is a good idea. Huh? Um, we all see, hopefully. Okay. Right. So, Roger, switching to auxiliary mode. I spin a 135-degree turn. The mech screams at the violence of the maneuver. Now the tic tics are closing on me. Three, two, one, here we go. Another bright light, um, another bright light pours out of my mech's back end. Some missiles hit, some others, some others miss. I'm taking too much fire. 
I'm swaying side to side like a vehicle out of control. Chino, help! Another ball of fire erupts before me. The cockpit glass shatters and vanishes. Something slices into me. At first, I don't feel the pain. I'm just so jarred. I, I don't know what or where it hits me. Then the, my mech starts quivering like a stricken animal. A terrible force sends me tumbling inside the mech. The world is spinning out of control. I cough and gasp as blue lasers blur out and so do the stars. Darkness creeps in from side to side. I feel myself going, shit, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Then nothing. See? So that's how you that's how you set the pace for how fast an action scene can be. But then I'll show you how to slow it down. In the next chapter, chapter 12, slowly my senses begin to return. First, the consciousness of lights, bright red and white dancing ones, beautiful and ecstatic, like tongues of fire winning against the silver moon. I try to move my lips and utter his name, but I can't get it out. A faint, single wheeze. The air is sick with the smoke and the smell of the burnt flesh. So, so you really see how you can slow down the moment by, by really making longer sentences. So that's what I'm saying. Shorter sentences, faster pace, longer sentences, slow down the moment. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, ano ang tawag dun? Parang short sneak peek of your book. <laughs> I think, wala mi rin nagtatanong, Ms. Kat, how much po ba yung book? Saan po sila makakabili? Ah, okay. Thank you for that question. It's a very nice question. <laughs> okay, so right now... Um, Tablai is being sold online. You can check us out on the Tablai Facebook page. So that's facebook.com slash Tablai Novel. Or if you want to go straight to our order form, it's bit.ly bit slash Tablai. Um, currently, um, it's being sold at 449 pesos. But it's paperback. Um, here are pages. And what's so cool about it, guys, is that we actually have schematics at the back. Like, you can see all of the cool um, schematics of our Mekatik Balang, Mekatik Tik, and everything. Um, we have an art mini, mini art gallery at the back. So it's $4.99 plus delivery fee. So buyer has to show you the delivery fee. Um, unfortunately, since MECQ is coming back, we'll see the, how we can um, deliver to other parts of the country. But definitely, I think Metro Manila will still stand. Um, I usually go... Um, through courier or, or um, let's say the same day delivery services. So learn more by visiting our page. Okay, sige po. Um, we have a few more questions, Ms. Kat. So from Daniel Cecilia Sulit, uh, this one's a very interesting one. I think marami pong makaka-relate dito. So how do you deal with writer's block? What tips can you share on hmm. how to get your writing, writing momentum back? Okay, um, I'm going to show you my personal experience and I'm going to tell you what tool I use because I go to a website. I'm not at all, you know, like promoting the website. I'm just saying that I, I use it and a lot of creatives use it then. Okay, so when it comes to me dealing writer's block, sometimes you just have to, okay, what I do is I, okay, I don't know where to go. I set the idea aside. You have, what you have to do is take a step back, okay? Realize, look at your work and say, what is wrong or what is the block that I am encountering? Let's say when it, com it, comes, to, when it comes to plotting the plot, I can't get past this segment of the story. What am I missing? What you can do is, um, I call these comps or comprehensives look at narratives that ideally have the same plot as yours. Let's say, um, what, is, what is the nearest? Okay, you know, um, in the publishing industry, I'm sure you know this, Ms. Hazel, you know what the comps are? They are works that are similarly related to your book. So if I were to describe Tablai, I would describe it as a mix of Ender's Game and Pacific Rim, and Trece. So if I 
if I am finding a hard time trying to get over this writer's block, I would revisit Ender's Game. I would revisit Pacific Rim. I would revisit Trese and figure out how they do it. I would also look at similar um, movies, films, video games that tackle my same line of thought and try to build an equation around it or punch through the wall, whatever works for you. When it comes to writer's block, sometimes we it's, it's all stuck in our heads here. What I suggest is that you put it down on paper and create a mind map. Mind map, character, problem. Then just, just expand it. What is my problem? How will I deal with this? So it's a very systematic way of thinking to just kind of try to untangle your thoughts. Um, for the website that I go to, it's called deckofbrilliance.com. So deckofbrilliance.com. It's an ideation tool used by many creatives um, where it kind of turns your ideas on its head and gives you a way, it gives you prompts on how you can twist the idea and bring it further. Yeah, so that's all I'm going to say. So just check it out. It's really cool. Deckofbrilliance.com. Oh, I'm getting paused now. Let's keep <laughs> these questions going. Take it, so we have a question from Misha Ong. Uh, I okay. think you also answered this kanina, pero I think he she wants to be must elaborate pa siguro, Miss uh, Kat. Uh, do you have okay. any tips on how to think of some Thing different or original in such a way that so many fiction novels around the world, how can you make your story different? Okay. Okay. So, um, like I said, but I'll, I'll, I'll expound more on this. Um, like I said, you have to find, you have to find extraordinary elements in the ordinary and you have to look back at your past and at your own personal narrative, what can you pull from that? Um, there's this concept that I love called creative capital. If you're ever familiar with what creative capital is, think of your mind as a bank. We like to keep on depositing into this bank. Whenever you read books new to you, whenever you watch documentaries and films, whenever you experience and talk to other people who do not share in your own personal point of view. And I think that's so important. You have to engage people who are not like you because you see the world in a way that is not yours. And this really opens your mind. You know that, you know that creativity is not born from a single mind. Creativity is a, it's accumulation of all of your experiences what you've digested into that creative capital. And once your creative capital is so rich, just like a bank, you can withdraw from it. And you can withdraw all of those experiences, what you learned from people you don't know, from people, from lessons that you've learned from, from failing, lessons that you've learned from engaging people who aren't like you. Like I said, you can create this rich narrative that probably has not been told before but it all has to come from a very human and very true insight about people. And that's how you really make it stand out. Because in some writing, um, some movies, fiction in general, yung ina-aspire nila is the bonga factor, no? As in parang, they can, they can try to impress people with brilliant prose, di ba? Sometimes the story is so flowery in writing, but you can't relate to it. Some stories rely on sound effects, um, explosions, and whatnot to give that wow factor. Or probably, if if you're more adult films, you know, would would do all of these shocking scenes, diba? Right? So that just served no purpose. But if you really want to tell a good story, you have to get to the heart of humanity, what what the person is, and tell that story through a lens only your own. Okay, thank you, uh, Miss Kat. Uh, do we have more questions? Uh, we have one po from Bless Chavez, but I'm not sure if uh, bagay siya sa inyo. Uh, do you ever write 
a table? If yes, how did you build? How do you build characters? Oh, okay. Um, so fables, kasi, are are more for. Okay, fables can still fall under folklore in a sense, right? Um, pero if you're talking about writing fables for kids, um, that's another genre. Um, I believe that when you write fables for kids, it. Ha, it it will still incorporate the same approach of knowing these same elements of the stories. Now, what's your premise? Like, let's say, what what can we say? Um, the what's a good what's a nice fable for kids? Ah, the hare and the tortoise, diva. Right? Hare and the tortoise is a very classic fable for kids. Um, see, it still incorporates all the elements of the story, which is what's the premise? These two animals. These two animals are racing after each other, but we see that the underdog wins. Um, what are who are the characters? That's the the hare and the tortoise. Um, what is the setting? Is an island bayan or something like that? Parang they race across an island, and then what is the what is the plot? Eshempre the 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 hare becoming so cocky that that he's going to win. Um, he he gets so cocky that he doesn't realize that the turtle, slow and and persevering, finally gets to the finish line, and the underdog beats the champion. So it still incorporates all the elements which I taught you guys. But for writing fables for kids, sometimes writing kids stories are so hard. Honestly, even harder than writing fiction, because you have to explain all these adult concepts to kids in the most digestible way possible. I mean, sometimes kids ask the hardest questions, like, "Mama, what is love?" Or, right? "Mama, what is God?" It right? was like, "What?" As an adult, you have to, you have to, to explain to these kids all of these hard concepts. And what I love and a peg that I can really give to, to you guys to to writing fables. I mean, it's not directly a fable, but please, please read Antoine de Saint Exupéry's. The Little Prince, right? <laughs> the Little Prince is one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite books of all time. Like, even as an adult, even as an adult, I look back at it and I realize it has such, it has such mature themes about not about not finding love at the right time. Charot, diba? I mean, you want to find love, but then the situation or does not call for it. Or what does it mean to have immature love? Sometimes you think you're taking care of the other person, but you're too focused on yourself. It also talks about being an adult, like how we we lose our inner child because we're too busy growing up that we forget the wonder of of our childhood days. So, so like please read that as as a base for writing fables for kids. Also check out Sir Joem Antonio's works. Sir Joem is actually Sir Joem. If you're watching, shout out po. Um, Sir Sir Joy Antonio is an eight-time Palanco winning award author. He's also my writing father. Um, a lot of the things that you've seen in this talk, I I took up in his writing classes. So I wrote, uh, I learned everything from how to write sci-fi fantasy from him. So check him out. Plug ko lang story writing school. Just search them on Facebook. Really good. Yun. Okay. Thank you, Miss Kat. I think um, that drops up our session for today. Uh, thank you, Miss Kat, for joining us. Thank you to everyone who participated. So, uh, so um, we have a feedback form for this session. So uh, that's bit.ly slash pod for session eval. I, sorry, bit.ly slash pod session for eval. Again, that's bit.ly slash pod session for eval. We'll also put them put this link on the comment section below. So make sure to fill up that feedback form in order to get your certificates. Ayan. Thank you, Miss Kat. Thank you to everyone. I hope you all stay safe. Um, the times are very these times are very uncertain. So make sure you stay safe, you stay healthy. Lagaan ng sarili. Okay? Yes. Thank you po. If you have Thank any you more again. questions, just message me sa tablay page din. I'll try to answer some of the questions here that are not answered, but baka mamaya, I have to go back to work. Uh.
Stay dumb. Okay, thank you, Vaughn. Yes. Thank you, Miss Kat. If you have any questions yes. about Publish On Demand, we can be rich via Messenger, our Facebook page. We also have email and... <laughs> email and Facebook. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Kat. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening. Bye. 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 <laughs>